uh, Franza is going to, going to talk to us today um, kind of about the floods in Durban and whether that was a result of climate change. Um, I think one of the key things that we're going to have to deal with in, in, uh, in the next few uh, decades um, as we adjust to um, a much higher temperatures um, and, and, and a much higher incidence of, uh, of uh, kind of events such as the Durban floods. Um, I think these kind of questions are really important uh, to, to kind of how we need to think about and research these, uh, kind of research these issues. So with that, I'm going to uh, pass it on to Professor Engelbrecht um, and ask him to, uh, uh, to then proceed with his address. Colleagues, it's a great privilege to make a contribution today by presenting in this seminar series um, being hosted by Professor Velodia. It's part of our, no, our new focus at WITS in growing a collaborative research field in climate sustainability and inequality. My talk is one specifically focusing on the climate change side of this. I'm going to reflect today on what happened in the, on the 11th and 12th of April this year when we had a meteorologically significant high impact weather event that tragically also killed almost 500 South Africans. So it is important that we reflect and that we learn the lessons that we can from what happened in the. And that includes answering the question that you can see on the screen at the moment, namely um, the role of climate change. What was the role of climate change in what happened in Durban? back in April. So I would like to acknowledge several co-authors I'm collaborating with in attempting to answer this question objectively. Um, the names are all on the screen there, um, but uh, it's, it's a group of colleagues from WITS, also from the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Australia and colleagues at the CSIR in South Africa. Um, and I should not forget also contributions from um, the Agricultural Research Council. So many thanks to all the collaborators in, this is our first presentation on this evolving research topic we currently have at the Global Change Institute at WITS. Let me just briefly remind ourselves of the unfortunate statistics of this event. Um, the current formal, formal statistics is that 489 people lost their lives in these floods. About 4,000 houses were destroyed. So President Ramaphosa, when visiting the communities affected by these floods, made an important statement. Um, he said that the, that the disaster is part of climate change. And then he said that climate change is a really serious issue. It is here. So on the site, when he was talking to our communities affected by these floods, he effectively made what we call in climate science an attribution statement. So he linked what has happened to climate change. Was he correct in doing so? That is what we are going to explore today in this presentation. But before we talk further about what happened in Durban, I'd like to point you to the words that another international leader said recently, spoken recently. And this was in the context of the floods in Pakistan. So in August and September this year, as I, I think most colleagues must, must know, since it's all it's everywhere in the media at the moment. There were absolutely devastating monsoon rains in Pakistan. Um, literally, one third of the country is currently underwater. Um, these floods are unprecedented in terms of their scale, their spatial scale. This satellite picture shows a brand new lake that appeared out of nowhere in a very dry part of Pakistan. It's 100 kilometers wide. So areas that receive, that annually receive about 
200 millimeters of rain in that dry southern part of Pakistan received more than a thousand millimeters of rain in one month. So following that, the Secretary General of the United Nations, he said that this is a monsoon on steroids. And he expanded on his statement. And he said it, of course, in the context of climate change, making this weather event and the monsoon range more intense than what it's supposed to be. And following on that, the Prime Minister of Pakistan has now just in the last few weeks and just in the last few days as well, made, I think, a number of really strong statements. And I think just a day, or two, a day or two ago, he said that what happened in Pakistan will not stay in Pakistan. And what he's, what he's saying is, don't think that in your country you will be spared these types of extreme weather event impacts. This is going to be increasingly a global issue. And then he asked, why are my people paying the price of such high global warming through no fault of their own? And then he explained that the contributions of Pakistan in terms of carbon dioxide emissions and global warming is not even 1%. So Pakistan is not a country that is responsible for the large quantities of increased greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. Yet they are now so severely affected by what he says is climate change. And then the third bullet is really also important for what the message I would like to convey today. Then he said, it is therefore entirely reasonable to expect some approximation of justice for this loss and damage. And that is the last part of the storyline I would like to talk about today. Um, if these weather events can indeed be attributed to climate change, who is responsible for that climate change? Is it fair that a country like Pakistan is not a major player in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, that there's a very, very small historical responsibility for the climate change that have occurred today? should suffer these types of losses without being compensated by who? By the countries most responsible for this problem of global warming, namely the, last, the large industrial economies of the global north. So let's talk today, let's explore a bit more attribution and loss and damage in the context of the Durban floods. Um, just before I get back to the topic of what happened in Durban, let me just um, state that loss and damage is, of course, a formally defined concept on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, the Paris Agreement reaffirmed the so-called Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage. And that mechanism internationally agreed is the main vehicle through which countries should be able to receive compensation for the losses and the damages they occur in a changing climate. Now, the link on this slide is a useful link to the UN FCCC pages on loss and damage for those of you who are interested in exploring this topic. But I can make a prediction today, namely that at the upcoming 27th Conference of the Parties, in Egypt um, in November this year, this will be one of the biggest discussion points. And it, it has always been one of the biggest and most controversial aspects of the climate negotiations. And often this has been an obstacle in terms of making progress in the negotiations. But after the extreme weather events we've seen occurring across the globe, since the previous COP exactly a year ago, I think we can be guaranteed that this will now be center stage once again in the negotiations. Now, back to what happened in Durban. There's the weather system late on the 12th of April um, that caused the flooding. It was a so-called cut of low pressure system. And 
By this time, the center of the system was now established over the Indian Ocean, just southeast of Lesotho. And meteorologists will, on this satellite picture, immediately recognize something strange, namely a dark area in the middle of the spiraling cloud band. Now that suggests that the weather system has assumed tropical characteristics. And that is an important feature of this weather system that developed on the 12th of April. And I'll get back later in this talk to its significance. Um, for now, I'll take us back um, with the slide on the right-hand side to the 11th of April. This is how the weather map looked on that day. Um, roughly at 500 hectopascals, so that's more or less five kilometers above sea level. And weather forecasters in South Africa, when seeing a map like that, will immediately be on the alert. They will see the characteristic signature of a so-called cutoff low weather system. Now, how unique was this weather system that caused the flooding? And was its presence the result of climate change? Well, it's easy to answer that question. Let me first take you back to the 22nd of April, 2019. The weather pattern is similar. It's also clearly recognizable as a cutoff low. And back in April of 2019, that weather system, caused about 180 millimeters of rain to fall in about 24 hours. And about 70 people lost their lives back in April 2019 in the Durban and surrounding areas of KwaZulu-Natal. So let's take note of this important fact. Just three years ago, before this year's event, there was actually a very, very, very similar event in the province of KZN, and 70 people, about 70 people died. Let's move to the slide, uh, the, the graph at the far left, 27 September, 1987, a cut of low caused devastating floods in Durban. In climate textbooks in South Africa, the floods of September 1987, are known as the Durban floods. And the, st the statistics show us um, that 509 people lost their lives back in September 1987 from this cutoff. That system caused 900 millimeters of rain to fall over a period of four days. So this shows us, colleagues, the first important fact. Cut-off lows have been occurring in South Africa for as long as there have been people living in South Africa. One of the co-contributors of this talk, Professor Stefan Grab of Witts University, he pointed out to me shortly, shortly after these floods, a very, very similar rainfall event that was recorded in Durban back in April, 1856. That was roughly 700 millimeters of rain in three days. And he has since found another such event back in 1905. So the first point I would like to make today is a, is a, is a, is a, is a strong point, if, we, if you will dissect this carefully. Um, cut of lows have been part of our climatology for as long as we've been living here. We have about 10 of them every year moving into South African territory. About two out of the 10 cause heavy falls of rain and some form of flood. I think what happened in September, 1987, and just three years ago, in April, 2019, should have been clear warnings for us of the amount of rainfall these systems can cause. And in April, 2019, we saw how vulnerable certain communities are living in certain areas of KwaZulu-Natal to these types of rainfall events and the flooding that cause. So the first thing we need to acknowledge, also if we think about this very similar event back in 1856, 
is that it is not straightforward to attribute what has happened in Durban to climate change. This is an example of an event, a type of weather system that occur in this region because of natural variability in the climate system. It has always been a risk for us. And I think we do need to ask, we do need to reflect on South Africans. Why were we not better prepared for what happened in Durban on the 11th and 12th of April? Now, that is a big question in its own right. I'll just state the obvious. For as long as we have tens or hundreds of thousands of people in our country living below floodlines, we are going to be vulnerable for these heavy types of rainfall events. Where I live in Tuani, more than 30,000 households are known to live below the floodline. So in a Durban area, when mighty rivers such as the Umgeni are in flood, that is, of course, an extremely hazardous situation. It's life, it's life threatening. So we need to reflect on why we still have so many of our people living in these most vulnerable areas. That includes these steep hill slopes in KwaZulu-Natal that are very well known to become unstable when the soils are saturated, especially if the vegetation is depleted. So these dangerous zones in terms of the steep hill slopes across KwaZulu-Natal and also in the Etiquini municipality region, this, this is well demarcated in terms of the zoning regulations of the city. So we need to reflect, why do people choose? or Why do they have no choice to live along, for example, these steep hill slopes, hill slopes or below the floodlines in the big cities? I think we all, we all as South Africans, have very good ideas of why this may be the case. Um, I will not elaborate on this today unless we have unless we have time in the question section. But let me point out, let me state the obvious. For as long as we have people living in these highly exposed areas, people that are highly vulnerable to flood events, the hard reality is there are going to be future cut of low events bringing heavy falls of rain with or without climate change. And we are going to see more damage. and We are going to lose more people in South Africa when it comes to the flooding induced by heavy falls of rain. So from that, from that somewhat depressing basis, let's proceed. And let us now explore what the relative importance of climate change was in causing this event. So I'm going to base this analysis firmly in the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change which just last year um, analyzed and assessed all the latest evidence that we have of climate change across the world, focusing on literally every region in the world, including a specific analysis for the Southern African region. Now, at the time when the report was released, we had an, our own big event here at WITS at the time, August last year, it was referred to as a code red for humanity by the United Nations Secretary General. Because of the fact that the report has found that we can already detect increases in extreme weather events in every habitable part of the world. So there's already overwhelmingly strong evidence that a wide range of different types of extreme weather events has already increased in frequency. The second reason why he, call, why he called the, the report the code red is because we are on the verge of exceeding certain dangerous thresholds in terms of global warming, where there will be further substantial increases in a wide range of dangerous weather events. So we are on the verge of exceeding the so-called 1.5 degree threshold of global warming, which is the first dangerous threshold. Where, where climate change will become more dangerous and potentially also irreversible. Let me explain what I mean with that. Um, in the report, you'll find the standard type of assessments of future climate change. The, 
The starting point is usually analyzing the level of global warming as a function of choices that we make. So in this graphic where we have time on the axis and we are looking on the time on the X axis and we are looking at the level of global warming on the Y axis, you can see that one potential pathway into the future is depicted by the two darker red lines on this slide. Those are so-called low mitigation futures where the world makes the choice to keep growing the, the world economy largely through burning fossil fuels. Now in such a future, the level of global warming reaches about four or even a bit more degrees Celsius by the end of the century. That is now compared to the current level of global warming of about 1.2 degrees Celsius. If we want to restrict global warming to below 1.5 degrees Celsius or, or failing to do that below two degrees Celsius, we need an entirely different um, way. We need a revolution in the way that we generate energy on the planet. So the two blue lines, they depict Paris Agreement type futures. Um, and in those types of futures, I'll show in the next slide what they mean, what they ask from us. But in those types of futures, we still have an excellent chance, the report has assessed, to restrict global warming to below two degrees Celsius. But the report also said, it's probably too late. It's more likely than not, that even if we do everything right now in terms of mitigation, it is now more likely than not that we will exceed the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold of global warming. So we need, that means we have to prepare. We have to know that we are committed to further warming and we have to be prepared for further and worsening impacts from, of climate change. So how do we achieve those blue type futures? Well, it's, it's in the first place about reducing carbon dioxide emissions. On this slide, you can see that our current emissions there on the left-hand side is in the order of about 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide being released every year. In a fossil fuel future, we just continue and we burn more and more coal and oil and emissions are in fact increasing over time. But in Paris Agreement type futures, if you look specifically at the, the light blue line there, that is the type of solution that still gives us a small chance of restricting global warming to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, very good chance to stay below two degrees Celsius. In that type of future, we need to halve emissions from current levels by more or less 2030. The formal estimate is we need to reduce emissions by 45% by 2030. That's a, that's, a, that's a stark challenge, I think we will all agree. That, in, that alone is not enough. Then by the middle of the century, we need to achieve carbon neutrality or so-called net zero emissions. So the future climate will evolve as a function of the choices we will make as humans in terms of how we are going to grow the world economy, what our energy sources will be. Let us now look at the science of climate modeling because that is the main tool that we have, climate models, to project future climate change as a function of, of these emission scenarios, and then also to make formal attribution statements of whether specific weather events can be attributed to climate change or not. So let me explain how this works in the last part of the talk. Firstly, these climate models are based on the laws of physics, uh, momentum, heat, momentum energy, and mass conservation. Um, so they are objective representations of the coupled ocean land atmosphere system. Solving these conservation laws of physics require very large computers. You have to solve large sets of uh, partial differential equations. But in the end, um, the science has become really well evolved. And about 50 independently, to some extent independently, climate, developed climate models 
contributed to the projections of future climate change in the most recent IPCC report. So if we look at how these models represent the global climate system um, over the last several decades, and then how they project change in the system, we obtain these types of findings. Um, and that is now where we start the analysis of what happened in Durban. The top left slide is the one I've shown already, levels of global warming as a function of different emission scenarios with time on the x-axis. The top right slide is the one that's important for us. It's the same type of graph, but now on the y-axis, we are looking at rainfall averaged across the world's land masses. On the x-axis, we have time. And yet the first important thing to realize is that if we look at the world's land masses on the average, just to start this discussion, we can already detect that the world has become wetter. Over the last five decades, there has been a systematic increase in precipitation over the world's land masses on the average. And the reason for that is actually a straightforward one. The warmer we make the atmosphere, the more evaporation there is into the atmosphere, the more moisture storm systems have available to eventually form clouds and cause rainfall. And the warmer the atmosphere is, the more energy there is in the atmosphere to build intense weather systems. So that's an important observation. Across the world, storm systems are becoming more intense. That can already, such a change can already be detected. Bottom left slide, Arctic sea ice is in decline. So over the last decade, we've observed the lowest Arctic sea ice concentrations on record. And under these low mitigation fossil fuel type futures, we will completely lose Arctic sea ice by the middle of the century. Imagine the Arctic Ocean without any sea ice, a precious ecosystem gone. That will be during the mid to late summer period in the Northern Hemisphere. And then the bottom right slide, sea level rise, really important. It also impacts, of course, eventually through flood events. But we are now on the verge of exceeding the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold of global warming. As I've mentioned, more likely than not, we will exceed that. The best estimate we have available is the early 2030s. Remember, we are already now at 1.2 degrees Celsius of global warming. This report made an assessment that somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of global warming, we will reach the threshold where we will initiate the irreversible melting of the Greenland and possibly also the West Antarctic ice sheet. That's 12 meters of sea level rise. It will take probably millennia for the ice sheets to melt away completely. But sea level rise by the end of this century under that type of scenario may well be in the order of a meter. And that will displace hundreds of millions of people during the course of the century. But this is where I really want to get to this next slide, the next two slides, before I bring the message home to Durban. Um, across the world, of course, not all regions are warming up equally fast. So the Arctic regions of the world are warming up the fastest. Some parts of the Arctic are warming at about four times the global rate of global, the global rate of, of warming. That's because of sea ice and atmospheric feedback processes. Where we live in Southern Africa, you can see in these slides, we are looking at the top left at the world that has warmed by 1.5 degrees Celsius. But you can see that the warming in Southern Africa will be higher than that. And a world that has warmed by three to four degrees Celsius globally. Model projections indicate that in such a world, the warming in the Southern African interior may be in the order of six degrees Celsius. And the oceanic areas on our East Coast are also warming up. So an important part of the Southern African climate change future is that we are heading towards a drastically warmer regional world. What about rainfall? Here we are looking at rainfall patterns, once again, as a function of the level of global warming. 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold, as I've mentioned, may be awaiting us in the early 2030s. 
And you can see that climate change models are projecting a generally dry Southern African region. So as Southern Africans, we need to think very carefully about the, adap the adaptation options that we have when our region that is so water stressed becomes likely drier and at the same time drastically warmer. So here are the three main findings that you'll find in the IPCC's assessment report. If I should summarize the statements for Southern Africa, it's these three bullets. And the third one will take us back to Durban and the last component of the talk. Firstly, as I've already mentioned, we can already detect systematic warming in Southern Africa. The interior parts have so far warmed at about twice the global rate of warming. Um, at the same time, the region is already is, is likely to become generally drier. And that's a change that for the first time, the IPCC assessed can already be detected. So there's a drying trend that can be detected in our larger summer rainfall region in Southern Africa, and also in the winter rainfall region. And then finally, another change that can already be detected as well, and that are projected to intensify as the world continues to warm, is an increase in intense or so-called heavy rainfall events in the eastern parts of Southern Africa. And that includes South Africa's eastern provinces as well as Mozambique. So the IPCC assessment tells us something important. Um, we can already detect increases in heavy rainfall events over the eastern part of South Africa, including KwaZulu-Natal, and we should ex expect further increases in such events, in their frequency of occurrence, as the world continues to warm. So that already gives us some background to what happened in Durban. But can we do better? And this is the last part of the talk, colleagues, before I conclude. Can we do better than that? And the answer is yes. There's a developing field in climate science that is known as, is becoming known, as weather event attribution. And in this type of research, we make use of climate models to explore whether a specific weather event was occurred because of climate change, or maybe if it was made more intense by climate change, or maybe whether that type of event will occur more frequently or is already occurring more frequently because of climate change. So attribution science is rapidly evolving. And at the WITS Global Change Institute, we have now established such a local capability. It still needs to go through the usual process of scientific peer review. But today I'll just share with you more or less how this works and some of the very, very first results. So effectively how it works is we would take the event that happened in Durban and we would simulate the event using a climate model. So that gets, that gets a bit technical, but effectively we provide to the climate model the so-called initial atmospheric state, let's say at two o'clock in the morning, South African time, on the 11th of April this year, before the flooding started. So we provide the climate model based on the laws of physics, of the atmospheric state at that moment in time. And then we allow the climate model to effectively predict, we say in hindcast mode, what happened. Now, the, the climate scientists in the audience today, I know yeah, in the room, I at least have some of my own PhD students that are attending. They will know exactly what that means. What I mean when I say that um, the atmospheric the atmosphere, or at least its representation through these laws of physics I've mentioned, sensitively depends on the initial state. Okay, that is known by the general public as the butterfly effect, or as chaos fear, that is, that is really relevant to the atmospheric sciences. So effectively, you cannot generate a single realization of what will happen once you provide an initial state to an atmospheric or climate model, you have to produce, provide many different initial states. So in the end, what we did in this case, we set up the model 
to have small variations, effectively in its initial state. And then we generated, in, in our case, 72 different realizations of what may have happened. And in this slide, we are just looking at a few of those. And those dark blue regions show where the model simulates that low previous system to have been late on the 12th of April. So this then gives us a measure of the uncertainty of the weather event that did occur on the 12th. So this approach is also what weather forecasters would use when they would forecast the event. They would look at a large ensemble of realizations. And from that, they would make a probability forecast of what may happen over the next two days. So the first stage in an attribution simulation is effectively just simulating, trying to simulate what did happen. To what extent can the modeling system uh, reflect what did happen and what, what is the uncertainty associated with those simulations? Um, now, where the attribution science take two further steps. It's surprisingly simple. We generate in the first step a world that is cooler. And then we place the weather system that occurred um, on the 11th and 12th of April, exactly in this case, on this, at two o'clock of African time on the 11th of April, into that cooler world. So we generate an artificial world. It's called a pre-industrial world where temperatures look like um, they were supposed to be looking without any greenhouse gas warming in that. So then we, then we investigate how much rainfall would this cutter flow have caused if it, if it occurred in a world without global. That's the first thing. And then just to get further insight into how the event depends on, on global warming and its regional manifestations, is we, we repeat the experiment where we typically double the warming that has already occurred. So we double global warming, of course, scaled into its regional effects. And then we see how this very same weather system would have evolved if the atmosphere was even warmer. So that is how straightforward the attribution approach is. In each case, we generate, in our case, about 72 different ensemble members. And that then gives us some uncertainty of how the weather system would have evolved in today's world, in a cooler world, and in a warmer world. Now, as far as I know, we are currently the only African-based group doing this type of science. I hope that many more will form. Because as you can see from the early parts of my talk, attribution science may well become increasingly important to inform decisions and policies around loss and damage. Um, on this slide, I'm sharing the first results of attribution studies being undertaken for our region. Our, our results are not yet uh, formally published. Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm sharing the only published results we have so far for what happened in Durban. It is, it, these are est uh, attribution estimations of the role of climate change in the Durban floods obtained by the so-called World Weather Attribution Service. So this is a big international consortium. They were faster than us in publishing a report. It's also not yet peer reviewed. So this is also not yet final. But they went through a very similar approach using global climate models, where in our case, we use more detailed regional climate models. So these are complementary approaches. And in their recent assessment, um, performing more or less the experiment I've just described, they've made an assessment that climate change increased the intensity of the Durban floods by 4 to 8%. Maybe that is less than what we expected, or at least that, our, that many of our politicians expected when reflecting on the event shortly after it happened. Um, we will have to see whether our own more detailed investigation will confirm this result. 
I think the regional aspects of the weather system, specifically that tropical type low that developed on the 12th of April, may actually indicate for a somewhat more important role of climate change in the intensity of the event. But what we have so far from the global climate models is an estimate of an increase of four to eight percent in the intensity of the event. How important was that in the resulting stream flow, eventual flooding? What is the relative importance in terms of the vulnerabilities of our communities in these regions? Those are difficult, more difficult questions to answer, I think. But what climate, si what climate science is telling us so far is that the event was made four to eight percent more intense than what it was supposed to be. So climate change did play a role, but it's not that climate change caused the event. And that I think was already clear to everybody in this talk, because I've, I've reviewed how often cutoff flows are impacting on our region. The second important finding is that this type of rainfall event, so an event that causes in the order of 450 millimeters of rain over a two day period, that was also assessed by the international consortium. And they found, they made another assessment that is maybe even more important, namely that this type of rainfall event is already twice as likely to occur in the Durban area than it is supposed to be. So that's an important find. So they are saying effectively, climate change has already made this type of event twice as likely as it's supposed to be, which is consistent with the IPCC assessment of a detectable increase in heavy rainfall events over the eastern parts of South Africa. And then some, intense, some increase in intensity of the event, which is of course exactly what we expect in a warmer world with more water vapor, thinking of the warm Indian Ocean, that is exactly what thermodynamics tell us should happen during a cut of low induced rainfall event. So I'm concluding with two slides. Um, the first is, the first slide is, um, the first of these last two slides, I would like to flag another type of risk. We can make, I think we can in a defensible way say that with or without climate change, Historical, historical events should have led us to be better prepared for the type of flood that occurred in Durban on the 11th and 12th of April. But climate change may also bring to our region unprecedented type of events for which there's no example of in the historical record. And I think we are seeing, already seeing these as well. The intense tropical cyclone, a category four hurricane that caused the Beira floods back in March, 2019, it, it killed more than a thousand people. The biggest flood disaster ever in Africa, south of the equator. That's something to take note of. What is the possibility of such a tropical cyclone occurring further to the south? where they've never occurred before at that intensity. For example, at Maputo, or even further to the south at Richards Bay, can such a system maybe move into the Mpopo River Valley? Colleagues, I think what has happened in Beira and what has happened in Durban should tell us that we are by no means prepared for this type of event. Let me try to follow on, a, to, to end on a positive note. Um, what are the positive aspects we can take of it? The first is we have climate science. So climate science gives us an idea, a good objective way to attribute the role of climate change in events that have occurred to date and to anticipate what are the likely high impact weather events that will in impact on our region over the next two decades and deeper into the 21st century. So climate change science is well enough developed to help us adapt to at least some of the, climate, some of the impacts of a changing climate system. Um, and secondly, we still have it within our hands as humans what that level of global warming is going to be. It's probably too late to clip global warming to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. But if the nations of the world 
can find it in themselves to come together, we still have an excellent chance of restricting global warming to two degrees Celsius, which means we can avoid many of the most dangerous and irreversible impacts of climate change from occurring in the first place. So with that being said, and um, given the technical problems we've had, Professor Velodia, I hope there's a bit of time left for questions. Let me uh, uh, thank you, uh, 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 Franta, for, for, for a really, really informative talk and for making all of the complexities of your field uh, uh, kind of accessible to all of us. Uh, I, I, I kind of certainly enjoyed that. Let me then open it up for, uh, for, for any thoughts or questions anyone has. For those who are, who are online, please, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, uh, part of Zoom to, uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, type out any questions you have. Um, I have a few on, on the Q&A system already, but let me take one from, from inside the room and then, and then we can, we can, we can, we, we can then, then move to the online ones. So we'll take one at the back there. Can you hear me guys? Oh, that's cool. How are you? How are you, sir? Thanks for asking. Thanks. Um, I, I have two questions there. Um, the first one would be, I love what you have presented so far um, um, throughout um, the course of this time. Um, you know, there's been a call by, by, by the Biden administration in the USA to fast track the, um, the trend of, of electric cars, right? Um, in, in a way to cap emissions um, from, you know, gas or, or so-called um, non-renewable resources of energy. So now I'm trying to figure it out. I think somebody also raised this question um, on YouTube. I watched this video on YouTube about the very same trend of electric cars and their so-called intention for, um, for those who, who want to pull the trend to lower down the emissions of carbon of CO2. Um, they want to be using batteries, right? Uh, which will be charged and so on and so forth. But I want to understand to you, because I feel like the process of having to build this, to, to build up to these batteries to power these cars on its own is carbon intensive. Uh, to, to try to reduce, you know, the use of non-renewable energy sources. Um, so I want to ask you a question, basically, in terms of to what extent do you think that the trend to build create electric cars will basically reduce CO2 emissions when in fact the process of making the batteries to function is carbon intensive in the first place. And so I think that's uh, my, my, my take or my concern with the trend towards this electric car um, movement. My second question would be, you know, I did a lot of stuff in terms of climate change, especially in my undergrad degree you know, as a geographer student as well. Um, a lot of states were, were, were you know, and, and, um, and, um, diagnosed or an, analyzed to say the least. But then I'm trying to figure out to what extent, again, can we differentiate between climate change as in global warming from natural climatic earth variations um, that could have acquired either whether with human intervention or not. Um, so I will, I will yield my, my question. Thank you, sir. All right. Do you want to deal with those two? Sure. Uh, sure. Since they are, since they are both, both important questions. So they are, they are really comprehensive assessments in terms of the relative role of a large growing renewable sector in South Africa and across the world in terms of the negative environmental impacts, for example, should we start to increasingly mine, for example, for the rare minerals and metals that are important for building, for example, large solar farms and wind farms. And um, it is certainly true that if you, if you build electric cars in certain ways, for example, in recent assessments I've seen for certain rather big SUVs, I won't mention the names, 
that indeed it is not environmentally friendly and it can potentially be carbon extent intensive. But if this is done in the correct way, and I would refer you, since it's not my own field of speciality, to the working group free report of the IPCC for a good quantitative assessment of what you've just asked. The overall benefits of converting the world's transport sector to become electric versus it currently being largely a fossil fuel based transport sector. Um, the benefits are immense in terms of making the, the transition in terms of reducing emissions. So I think that the, 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 world, the conversion of the world's transport sector to becoming electric is now having unstoppable momentum in some countries, starting in the European Union. And um, if a Biden type administration remains in power, also in the US. I think this is a very important thing for South Africa to think about. Much of our exports is in terms of combustion car engines, um, which, which require, by the way, um, a great deal of platinum. How vulnerable are these exports that South Africa are making in a world that is increasing, increasingly going to build electric cars? How quickly can that sector in South Africa transform itself? Um, so your question has important implications. I think it is very clear that um, making the transport sector electric is a big, big component of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I think it's going to happen. I think the momentum is building. We need to make sure that we follow that trend in South Africa and that we don't fall behind. That, of course, require very big policy changes in South Africa and technological advances in terms of making our own transport sector electric. The second question is right in my own field of speciality. So natural climate variability cannot explain many of the trends we've observed over the last five decades in the climate system, starting, of course, with global warming and regional warming. There's no naturally varying process that can explain the rate of warming detected over the last five decades. Yes, the Earth does naturally go through cold and warm phases as it goes into ice ages and into warm interglacial periods, but that's at a time scale of several tens of thousands of years. So the only explanation that we have available to explain the trends in climate that can be detected already is the increasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which is warming that, which is warming the atmosphere. And then attribution science gives us the way of tackling actual individual weather events by exploring how those events would have behaved in a pre-industrial cooler world versus the current world versus a future warmer world. Uh, great, thank you so much, Franco. I'm 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 now going going to move online and combine um, a question that's that's in the uh, kind of Q and A asked by by. Uh, uh, can't, but uh, 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 that's, uh, that's asked by Jennifer Fritchard and also by Otto Malvisa. Um, uh, Otto's question asks whether the, the uh, uh, kind of evidence is that these kind of extreme events are, are, are kind of increasing in 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 both their intensity and their frequency and i think you've answered the, that you've made clear that the answer to that question is yes he and uh, uh kind of jennifer then ask what are your thoughts on uh kind of on what appropriate um um mitigation and adaptation strategy should be. And I think that is such a critical question for us living in Africa. So we, we do need to contribute our fair share to the climate change mitigation process. But we also have to admit that successful climate change mitigation is not in the first place in our hands. 
it is the northern hemisphere industrialized economies that that's where most of the emissions are. So if geopolit geopolitics in the north are not going to allow a coherent international response in terms of climate change mitigation, we are committed to drastic war in Southern Africa. Not by the end of the century, over the next two decades. So we have to adapt. We have to have an excellent national adaptation strategy and adaptation strategies across different levels of government governance and for different sectors, for example, across the various components of the ag agricultural sector. Just think about our water security. So there's an enormous amount of work that needs to be done in South Africa. Let me point out that our Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment has been really proactive in recent years. For example, by developing first over a 10 year period, South Africa's so-called long-term adaptation scenarios, then that got converted into the third national communication on adaptation, or the third national, the third national communication on climate change, including an adaptation chapter. And finally, in a national adaptation strategy released, I think, 2020. Maybe I think it was 2019. So in terms of policy, we are actually, our, our governors are different to some other countries. In fact, listening to the climate scientists, that is extremely positive. And our international climate change directorate in that same government department has always been standing strong with solid positions in the international climate change negotiations. So in terms of adaptation policy, we are in a strong position in South Africa. But how do we implement it? Where do we find the funding to adapt to climate change? Because that's where it's becoming difficult. Um, I can only say that climate change adaptation is often expensive. For example, it, 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 in, in many cases, it, it's about giving people safe land to live, convincing them to live there. They have to trust government to make such a change. There needs to be funding available. Um, and we all know how challenging it is in South Africa at the moment in, term, in this context. Um, let me not expand on that because I think we are all familiar with many of these challenges. Climate change adaptation and its funding is a big challenge for us. Much of that funding under the Paris Agreement of, on Climate Change should come from the international community. There are important developments in that regard, but we also have only so much time today. So I return the floor to Professor Velode. Great, so I'm, I'm going to take an, um, another question from, uh, come from the online Q&A. Um, and this is from Glenn Robbins, which f follows on, I think the, the point that you made. So what Glenn, what Glenn says is that we, uh, uh, that that in our uh, in our climate uh, uh, policy frameworks, we con we we kind of seem to uh, uh, concentrate a, 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 a lot on the on on kind of on the question of emissions because the objective is to is to reduce the. the the, the level of global um, the level of global warming, but, but um, it's 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 kind of quite clear from your presentation that the that the droughts and 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 the floods that that we're experiencing are 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 are, 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 are kind of having huge effects, and that those effects are 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 Kind of really accentuated by the fact that we haven't had the levels of investment and the proper investments in things like uh, uh, public housing. So, for example, he says many of the houses that that were flooded, kind of in the Durban area, were were, were kind of houses that were built uh, kind of through through 
uh, public sector programs. And that the, the, the kind of ongoing cuts in, in uh, public expenditure, the lack of investment in social infrastructure means that the, that, that the, the, the marginal increases in le levels of rainfall, uh, for example, have much l l larger impact socially and kind of economically because we're not, we're not doing enough kind of on that social and economic side. So what are your thoughts on that, Raja? Well, I would, I think I would agree that we do need to have a larger emphasis on climate change adaptation in our overall national response. And let me point out again that there is a very well formulated national adaptation strategy, uh, well informed by South Africa's climate science community. So we do have a strong foundation to work from. But I think an example of of why I would agree about the statement Glenn has just made, is if, if we take into consideration the 8.5 uh, billion US dollar just transition transaction offered to South Africa around the time of COP26 a year, almost now a year ago. Um, most of the talk in terms of how that investment may look like in terms of grants, um, cheap loans and so forth, was focused on climate change mitigation in South Africa. So most of the time when I heard members of the Presidential Climate Commission speaking about this, or some ministers, the focus was usually on mitigation. And in some cases, it was directly about ESCO and how this funding can help them out of the current predicament or onto a new path towards becoming a renewable energy provider. There has been far too little emphasis on dedicating a portion of that funding and investments towards climate change adaptation. So I think that must be a much stronger focus. Uh, in fact, not only in South Africa, but across the African continent. And I would like to make another prediction, namely that the Africa group of negotiators at COP27 in Egypt, maybe two months from now, are going to take the strongest position yet in terms of insisting on climate change adaptation investments into the developing world. So Glenn, I think you have a good point, and I think there are more developments coming along those lines. Let's take another question uh, from uh, 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 kind of uh, from here. So let me pass it on to you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, sir, for your presentation. Um, I just have uh, <clears throat> two questions. Maybe the other one is more like a comment. So my first question is. Um, you know, I'm always worried when I read through and <clears throat> um, I also think of um, the way people are using uh, the global circulation models and especially the ones that are going to be predicting the future uh, conditions. And I always think to myself, there's a lot of stuff that's happening in there, people downscaling the models and using them to predict even beyond 2100. And yet, from what I um, have gathered, it's not data that is coming from very far away that's been used to, you know, to, <clears throat> to make this focus. It's uh, probably data from the 50s or 60s that's being used and then to project things that are happening in 2300 because I've seen a lot of that. Um, how accurate is that? Like uh, when it comes to you know, modeling. I've seen a lot of different models that are out there that are being used. And considering that conditions may be changing, maybe they're using current conditions that we have here. What are the chances that maybe by 2080, even things will have changed? 
And the other thing that I've also noticed is that um, even in the RCPs that we have currently, um, what are the chances that by the time we get to 2039, things will have completely changed? Because I feel like maybe even next year we could be in the very worst case scenario, like in an 8.5, when we think we're doing measures to actually curb you know, the, the, the situation or to adapt. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for these uh, pure climate modeling questions. Much appreciated. So I would say um, the global climate models in combination with the regional climate models have evolved to the extent where they can now provide us with actionable messages for adaptation. So the combination of global and regional climate models have become so robust in their projections of certain aspects of climate change that we have enough confidence to take action. For, ex we, for example, we know that for the largest Southern African region, the rate of warming is going to be substantially higher than the global rate of warming, and likely the region will become drier. So obviously, we need to prepare for a future that is drastically warmer and systematically dry. Um, the climate models, of course, cannot, they cannot answer your last question. They, they cannot, the one thing they can't simulate is what we are going to do. And that is why we have no choice but to provide them with this range of scenarios. So the one extreme is strong and immediate cuts in emissions, almost halving emissions by 2030 achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. That's the one end of the spectrum. The other end is a future where we just simply continue to burn more and more fossil fuels at even higher rates. And then there's a range of scenarios in between. Climate models are considering all the scenarios and they're projecting climate change belonging to each of, the, each of these outcomes to help inform policymakers in making hopefully the right decisions in terms of what, what economic and development pathways to pursue. But, but overall, let me point out again, the models are based on the laws of physics. Those are universal. So they remain valid over time. Global climate models are really good in projecting the global changes, like changes in, say, the westerly wind regime and how it is, for example, being pushed forwards in a warmer world with big implications for South Africa's winter rainfall phase off. And then with the help of regional climate models, we explore what are the regional consequences? What are the consequences for cutoff lows impacting on KwaZulu-Natal, for example? So the science is well evolved. There are, they are uncertainties. Some of the biggest uncertainties and most important ones that exist still today is about the Antarctic ice sheet. Those dynamics and thermodynamics are not that well understood. So that's a big uncertainty. Um, there are also uncertainties in terms of certain cloud-related processes. For example, thunderstorms in a changing climate. But climate models try to deal with that by generating large ensembles, as I've shown, and by being run at increasingly higher resolutions. The science is, advanced, is advancing. There's more to do. But in terms of the large regional changes, I think we already have enough confidence to make the right, in their projections, to be able to make the right adaptation investments. Great. Thank you, Francois. I'm uh, going to, to, to go uh, uh, back to the Q&A online and I uh, uh, can raise a question that uh, David Hallows asks, and it intrigued me, uh, kind of it, it, it kind of intrigued me as well. So in one of your your kind of earlier slides, you you mentioned a tropical like circle um, in the center of that that map. Uh, what, what is the what is the sign, uh, what, what is the significance of that, and does it does it suggest that there was another dimension to the storm? 
I think that that may turn out to be the biggest question in terms of the meteorology of the storm. And that is exactly what we are currently investigating using our own modeling effort. So what I can, what I can share in advance before this has become a published finding is that the analysis we are doing, we are doing has thus far shown us that this weather system has done something that has never happened before. Um, when it moved into the Indian Ocean um, over the northern coastline of KwaZulu Natal on the 12th of April, it changed its structure. And what was a weather system that formed over the Atlantic Ocean, a so called mid latitude, or a so called cold core system, and that then moved over South Africa from the west to the east, as these systems usually do changed its nature almost completely and became what meteor meteorologists would call a warm core system or a tropical weather system. Now that occurred on the 12th and the weather system produced some further rainfall of course on the 12th that made the flooding even worse. This change from a mid-latitude to a tropical system is not the main change. Uh, most of the rainfall occurred from the traditional cut of low weather system while it was over the interior and approaching KwaZulu Natal. But this tropical, tropical, in inverted brackets, weather system that formed um, over the Indian Ocean worsened and made, made higher the rainfall totals that occurred on the 12th. Now, in some of our simulations of that big ensemble that I've mentioned, where we explore the different possibilities of what could have happened. Um, that weather system moved back from the ocean and made landfall for a second time over kwazulu So in some of the simulations, the flooding is even worse in terms of what happened. And that is where the alarm bells start ringing. That, that black um, cloud-free part that we've seen in the satellite picture, that is what meteorologists would find to be very similar to the eye of a tropical cycle. So if you don't maybe have that much experience in the field and you, you, you would have looked at that spiraling cloud system with an eye and it's an eye-like thing in its center, you, you, you would have think it's a tropical cycle. Now it wasn't in terms of intensity and so forth, but we have a really, really important question to answer here. Is it possible that a tropical cyclone type weather system can form in this way? Now, this research is likely going to show that it is the first time in recorded history that a cold core system converted itself into a tropical weather system um, south of 50 degrees south. In fact, um, we can say that this, this, what happened over the Indian Ocean on the 12th of April has never happened before, at least not in the satellite era. That goes back to 1979. So that is an absolute unique aspect of the event. I don't think that was the main cause of the flooding. Of course. It, it contributed further on from the 12th. Um, but the question is, what is going to happen in an even warmer world? Is it possible that a tropical cyclone type circulation system can form um, over the Indian Ocean east of Kozil Natal from being, being spawned or originated by a cutoff flow system? This is a question we've, we've never asked before. So I think this is a, a, a very important example of how climate change can cause completely new types of what we call in meteorology synoptic types or synoptic weather systems. So to be explored. Um, and I think the other possibility I've mentioned in the talk, that is one of a tropical cyclone that conventionally falls in the Mozambique channel or deeper into the Indian Ocean. And then in a warmer world, there's the ability to propagate further southwards. That is the usual way in which we've been thinking a tropical cyclone can get as far south as Richards Bay. But Durban may tell us that there's another possibility. 
And um, this research effort is underway, and I hope we can we can submit our findings before year end for peer review, and then Professor Valeria, maybe we'll have, we can have some follow up talk. If you on that, let's take one <laughs> one last question from inside the room. Over to you in the front here. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Um, my question is, uh, has a engineering application, really. Um, you say that we have more and more good um, information about, or the models are getting more and more accurate about what we could possibly expect. So I've been reading that in Australia, for instance, um, where houses have been pretty much blown away. Um, they've been working very hard on their building standards um, that people can tell a real difference between their roofs being completely demolished and a house sort of being okay um, in which kind of building standards were implemented when the house was built. Of course, the more storm resilient you make a house, the more expensive it is to build. But um, in both Australia and California, um, insurance companies are now starting to say what they will cover and what they will not cover. So right. in California, for instance, there are places where um, the federal government will have to step in if people refuse to move because the, the um, commercial insurance companies are refusing to insure things. Long intro. My question is, to what extent are South African insurance company actuaries and the people who look after the building standards, particularly for domestic buildings in this country, starting to take climate change and the likely increase in building standards into account? Oh, it's an important question. I would say the building environment has a big role to play in South Africa in terms of mitigation and adaptation. Firstly, by reducing energy demand, with buildings that are with green buildings that are designed to be as energy efficient as possible. I think I think we have a major problem. I think although voices are going are coming are going up in this sector, buildings are still currently designed using climate data of the last 40 years instead of using the climate data of the next 40 years because buildings are designed to stand, of course, for 50 or 100 years. They should be designed for the future, not for the climate of the last few decades. That's a major problem. Um, I am not up to date to what extent um, the, the building design standards are catering for the, for example, the increasing impacts of flood events in certain parts of our country, or in terms of human comfort in buildings, if we think of, the intense heat waves, the unprecedentedly intense heat waves we expect to occur already in the next 20 years. But my suspicion is that these design uh, benchmarks are not based on the future climate, but in the work I've contributed to in, the, in recent years on past climates, which doesn't make sense. So I think you've raised another important point a really, really important field, I hope, increasingly important field in the bold environment to be pursued specifically for South Africa. So, uh, so, so, so uh, we, we, we're quite close to the end and we, we're running out of time, but I'm, 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 I'm kind of tempted to, to kind of summarize some of the, the kind of questions that are online and put one final question to you. Uh, with, with all of the science that we have and kind of all of our abilities to predict these events and the knowledge that we have, kind of in your view, why were we not better prepared for the Durban floods? Yeah, it's a... It's, it, it's such a critical question. I think in our field, we've been reflecting on this. I think since the Beira cycle, we've been reflecting. Um, I think a part of the answer is in the, is in the uptake of the science. 
if we think about what happened in Beira, three days of three days ahead of landfall after cycling, um, weather predictions were indicating that landfall is going to be at Beira. And in Beira Harbor, precautions were taken and damage to infrastructure were limited in there. But in the informal settlements around Bay, by the time that the cyclone made landfall almost at midnight on the 14th of March, 2019, people were still living where they always are. They didn't evacuate. And the Bay cyclone came with an immense and destructive storm surge that warm of that wall of seawater that moved in from the ocean into, into those areas around the harbor. And in the middle of the night, it must have been an absolutely um, extremely scary experience. And it was, I mean, hundreds of people died in there and many of them in the storm surge. So this is a really important point. I was hoping I get a chance because I, I wanted to mention this in my talk and I did it. What we need here, is something that is becoming known as community-based early warning systems. Or we can also say, in this case, community-based flood early warning systems. You need to have the trust of a community in order for them to be willing to take action on that warning. Um, the science is now being developed and understanding is being developed in terms of why people didn't evacuate in Beira. Um, in the case, uh, one, one reason is that people don't necessarily want to leave their property behind. So they need to have some confidence in their government that to the extent possible, their properties will be looked after. Where will they go? Wherever they are going to, they need to have security and safety and, and clean water and food for a few days. So we do need to learn to evacuate. We need to learn to evacuate tens of thousands of people in South Africa out of the path of such a storm. Remember, 40,000 people were displaced forcefully anyway by the floods. Why didn't we just evacuate the 10,000 most vulnerable people? There is one good news story that is becoming um, clear. There is one really important aspect of what happened in Durban, namely in the so-called Quarry Road community where there was a community-based early warning system in place. Um, I'm still learning more about what happened here, but my understanding is that um, the University of Kuzulu Natal and researchers there were quite prominent in, its, in that system being set up. But in that specific community, the early warnings did reach the community and the community leaders have had a relationship of trust with the relevant forecasting agents and they took they took action. And in that community, uh, my understanding is that about 400 informal houses were eventually destroyed by the floods. But those people were no longer there when the flood struck. So they evacuated. And the Durban floods could have been actually, I'm starting to develop some appreciation that it could have been worse if that very flood prone community was not protected through a community based early warning system. So I think it's about the uptake of the science at the community level. That is one thing that we've missed in the larger Etikuni area. There is one really good news story we need to build on. Um, and I think then we must also admit that there are cases where the early warnings themselves are still not good enough. I, I've said that the science is good, but it's not perfect. So we need to be absolutely on our toes in terms of weather forecasting in South Africa specifically, in terms of future extreme weather events. It needs to be an absolute priority and well-funded area in South Africa so that we have top-notch early warning systems informed by now casting systems, radar, satellite, the best possible weather predictions. It is, a, it is a, certain type, it's a certain type of technology set that we can still improve on in South Africa. Uh, great. So sadly, we've, we've now uh, <laughs> uh, 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 gone past the time that we allocated for this. Uh, I'd like to just uh, th uh, th thank the team that helped us to, uh, to kind of organize this event, 
to do all of the online preparations, etc. Thank you to all of you who joined us here and uh, 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 joined us online. Um, and a really, really special thank you to uh, uh, kind of to you, Professor, uh, uh, kind of to you, Professor Engelbrecht, for uh, for um, making your 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 kind of exciting and 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 kind of absolutely important uh, 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 kind of research available and accessible to us. We're all extremely grateful to you. Uh, uh, Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. And for those who are driving, keep safe.